Welcome, friends, to this monthly meeting. Again, I am going to use this electronic media. It's a new way we can now meet each other without your having to leave your homes and without your having to travel far off distances to come and see me. Since I spoke to you last time on the Badara Day, 2nd April, I have received thousands of emails and text messages from many of you informing me that you are all safe and sound and healthy. I am very happy to hear all that. And as I said, somebody had told me in 1947, when there were a lot of riots going on, Great Master Baba Savan Singh helped many people and they were saved from illness and the difficult time that they were going on at that time. And I had mentioned in the Badara that now again, Great Master's blessings are still with us. And I'm very happy to receive so many emails, so many messages showing that all of you are well and safe. I have to thank Great Master for taking care of all of us. His uh, grace and blessings are with us all the time. In addition to these beautiful messages about everybody being safe and in good shape, I also get the regular messages that our mind is giving us a lot of trouble, that we are not able to meditate properly and our ego is not under control. So I thought I'll mention to you today a few words about what is ego, what is our mind and what is the face of the mind we call ego. The theme that I am bringing up today about ego arises from a very short but very significant statement occurs in our scriptures. In Punjabi, it says, Homme dirag rog hai, daru bi ismahi. Homme dirag rog hai, daru bi ismahi. That ego is a very chronic disease, but the treatment for that ego is also within itself. Now that looks strange, a contradiction, that the very problem we are trying to solve, the problem of ego, has to be solved with ego and with nothing else. This I-ness that we have, I am so and so, I know this thing. The I that is ego, which we use all the time, in all our conversations, the I comes in, me comes in, mine comes in, I, me, mine, all these are terms signifying that we have adopted an individuation of ourselves. And most of the problems of life that are coming to us are because of this ego, I. What does I do? When you say I, you separate yourself from all the rest. This separation of the self from everybody else, that is the way that ego operates. By separation, you are creating a problem because everybody else becomes the other, somebody else, not yourself. I have often said, that the truth is that we are all one. But when I say one, I'm not referring to one I, I'm referring to totality of consciousness, which means all that there is, the experiencer and the experience are all one. This we de discover only when we go to our true home, such khand, which is beyond the mind. And that is why when we say totality of consciousness is the reality, the truth, we are not talking of any I, but we are talking of everything that exists. Everybody that exists is part of it. So where does I come from? The I only comes when the mind separates the self from others. And then we have problems with the others, because we separated them. If you did not separate the I from the others, there would be no problem. If we are able to only look at the totality the big picture, we find there would be no problem, except that the problem is that the I is now participating with others who are different from the I. Now, what does it mean that the I, the ego, home, is a chronic disease? And the treatment is also within itself. The obvious thing is that if you don't have any I, you cannot be a seeker, you cannot do meditation, you cannot follow any path. You can do nothing. 
So you are stuck. Therefore, to get over the problem of the ego, you have to use the ego itself. A seeker is one who can seek within himself or herself. That means that the ego of the I-ness has to be used to beat the I. Now, I have often spoken to you about a spiritual will and a mental will. What is the distinction? The spiritual will is also ego. It's an I-ness. It is, I am going to surrender to the master. I am going to do meditation. I am going to withdraw my attention within. I am going to do every, everything I can to find my own self. That's also ego. But it's a positive ego. It takes you in the direction of discovering the totality of consciousness. On the other hand, an ego that's constantly taking us outside and is focused on what is happening outside of ourselves, that ego is a chronic disease. Going within with the same ego is a treatment for the same chronic disease. Now one might wonder, where does this ego, spiritual ego, the spiritual will come from? It comes from beyond the mind. We thought ego was only a function of the mind. And I have often said, the ego we use to function in this world is the face of the mind. And yet I say that there is a foundation, a fundamental principle lying even beyond the mind, which creates the ego. Now when we want to call the creative power, the creator, by any name you call the creative power, God, God is the creator. Allah is the creator. Ishwar Parameshwar is the creator. You can use any word. Zeus is the creator. We are personifying our totality and giving the root of ego right from there. Therefore, when we want to make an entity, a, pers a personification of totality, we are starting the ego right from our own true home. When we say the true home, is where you can maintain your totality as well as your individuality. The individuation that generates a soul, a soul is individual. So we are really laying the foundation of the ego, the real ego that is helpful to us right from beyond the mind. And this is not understood very often, that if we did not have individuation at all, there'd be no ego even to help us go back. So that is why there is a distinction between the individuation that we create beyond the mind. Where does individuation occur? It occurs when we go just below our true home, when we leave such khand and go to Parabrahm. Parabrahm is beyond the mind. And yet we say a soul exists there. A soul, individual soul exists there. So the foundation of ego is way beyond where we think it is. What we are dealing with is the mental ego and not the spiritual ego. Now, nobody talks of spiritual ego because the word ego has constantly been associated with something that's coming in the way of our own journey towards the true home. So that is why they don't speak about it. But when we say we have to develop a spiritual will, and the spiritual will will take us beyond the mind, it helps us to go beyond the mind because we are realizing our own individuated self as a soul. So it's important to understand that the foundation of all experiences, whether they are above the mind or below the mind, are arising out of individuation. And individuation, when used by the mind, creates the ego that creates problems for us. The same individuation when it is taken to the soul level, spiritual level, helps us to go back to our true home. So it is important to know that when we say that the diff diff different souls are dancing and singing in such khand, are they really separated from such khand? No. Our true home has that great facility that we can be total and individual at the same time. That's a very beautiful setup there, that we can experience separation and totality union at the same time. Now, how does that happen? Because there is no time 
and space over there. If you take away time and space, you find everything gets unified. It is only the time and space that makes the ego separated from us, and then it becomes a mental ego. We have to remember that we are currently in physical bodies living in space and time. And space and time has been created through the mind. So that is why the ego operating in space and time is quite different from the individuation that exists beyond time and space. But the foundation of this was laid there. Sometimes people wonder if this creation of ours in which we are sitting now, is it actually quite separate from what we are having in such kind? Not at all. Everything we are experiencing here is also being experienced in such kind. In fact, there is nothing outside of such kind. Whatever we are experiencing now, I am talking to you now, it's all happening in our true home. All we have done is to lose the awareness of it. And we are having a very short, very short slice of awareness, which we call a physical world. When the awareness changes to a larger awareness, we call it astral plane, and we shut off the awareness of the physical plane. These are various, various methods we employ to have different experiences in time and space, which is the basis of this whole creation that we are going through. Time and space are the secret by which we are able to generate something outside of ourselves. Otherwise, we would be inside of ourselves. Time and space is what makes us feel that the creation is outside of ourselves and we are barely experiencers of this creation sitting here. But the truth is that time and space have merely been created so that what was inside looks like it is outside. Even what looks like outside today is not happening outside at all. It's all happening inside us. Everything is happening inside. By creating time and space, we project it outside. People feel that if we project outside, we should be able to change what is there. And that is true. We can change what is outside from the place from where we project it outside. When we talk of the different levels of consciousness, we know which is the level of consciousness where we project outside. It is not the physical level. In the physical level, we are only experiencing what is outside. We have no power to project anything other than what has been stored inside ourselves. That is why when we look outside, it's a regular life that we are leading. It's a destiny we are going through. But where do we change it? Where do we create it? It is not at the physical level, not even at the inner level, which we call the astral plane, or the plane where imagination can create everything. Not even there. It's at a higher plane where we generate space and time. It's only at that stage that we project what is outside. If you want to change something outside today, go to that level. You'll be able to change everything. But do you actually want to change when you go there? It's an interesting experience. And I know great master once told me that if you like to change everything, you think it's not fair, not, it's not a good creation. There is some imperfection in creation. Go inside and have a look and then say, what changes will be better for the creation? And the little experience he gave me made me know and get convinced there was no change I could make. The perfection can only be seen when you go into totality. The totality shows you the perfection of this universe of creation. Otherwise, when you're only looking at part of the creation projected outside from our mind, it is imperfect. Any time you look at something in part is imperfect. But when you look at the total, it becomes perfect. This creation is exactly like that. Now we are sitting here in the physical plane. I'm talking to you in the physical plane. This is all predetermined. We are not making any change in here. Everything we are doing here is predetermined. By use of our free will, the experience of free will, it looks like we are making some alterations, making decisions, and we are making things happen according to our own will. But that will is also pre-recorded. If you go up into the higher levels, you will find that the 
predetermined life that we are leading here was predetermined at a higher level, not here. You go to that level, you can change what is predetermined, but not while you are here. So that is why it's very useful to find out what do we have inside us? What do we have actually inside that we can have so much power to change everything outside? There we discover that what we are experiencing now has been generated from there. So the ego part which I am mentioning is only a way of experiencing in separation from the rest of creation. We create the whole thing and we experience it. Experience can be done in many ways. It's not necessary that you have to be in a physical body to have experience. We have experiences without physical body. When we die, something is left over and we can find out what kind of life that would be if we had no body and yet the self was still there, the sense perceptions are still there, the mind is still there, the soul is still there, everything is intact. Now, this could be a guesswork because nobody who is dead has come and tells us what happened. But we can find out before dying what it would be like when we die. That is why they say dying while living is very important to understand what is inside us and what happens when we die. The life that we are leading here is physical life. When we leave the body, it becomes astral life or a life of a body which has everything else, all sense perceptions intact, the mind thinking mind intact, the same soul, life-giving soul intact. Everything is intact, except that the outmost cover of the physical body has disappeared. If we do it while we are alive, we'll have no problem understanding what happens when we die and what happens to us. We are still alive. Death is not really the end of life. Death is the end of a particular cover we are wearing, which is the physical body. And our life continues. And we come back again and again in physical body. Now, where is the programming set that we should come back again and again? Is that programming also set in the astral self? Not at all. The astral self is created in the same way the physical self is created. And the reason why the astral self is also experiencing like the experience of the physical body is because nothing is created at the astral self or the physical self. The creation of our destiny, the creation of the pattern of our experiences is done a little higher up at the causal plane, in the current sharir, that is where we make our destiny. From where space and time are projected out and events are placed on those space and time. Therefore, if we haven't gone to the causal plane, we cannot even know how our destiny was created. Destiny is totally fixed in the astral plane, totally fixed in the physical plane. Therefore, just having a experience of death or dying while living and finding out that we are still alive does not give us the real knowledge of how destiny is created. If we want to find how destiny is created, we have to go further up. Fortunately, it is possible through meditation to experience these things, to experience what it is like to be in the astral plane, what it is like to be in the causal plane. So meditation gives us the experience of validating all the theories we have been hearing about creation, about predetermination. It gives us a chance to prove to ourselves that we are creating our destiny at a certain level of consciousness which is called the causal level. Now the causal level is not merely another body of ours. The body disappears as we know it. The causal level is where concepts come in. Concepts. Concepts, including concepts of values. We now say, we count some numbers. We say this is two times that. This is five times that. This is something we are saying at the physical level and we are saying at the astral level, what is five times? What is the number five? What does it represent to have a value that has increased five times? It's a concept that is a living thing. A soul can be wearing a, a, a costume in the causal plane of the number five. 
we talk of certain other concepts that have come up, creating ideas for us. All those concepts are actually like living beings in the causal plane. It's a very different kind of life there. There is no comparison between what is happening in the causal plane and what's happening in the two lower planes. The two lower planes are, of course, very similar. When we use our imagination in meditation and we imagine that we have a body, which is very easy to imagine, we close our eyes and we can feel we are still there. We can feel we have a body. We can also feel that we are there in another form in which we can fly, we can do many things. The body remains still. The physical body remains still and we can have so many activities with our imaginative self. Now, we call it imaginative self, but if we were able to withdraw our attention completely from the physical body, that imaginative self becomes a reality more real than even the physical body. But we don't do that. We don't try it. We are constantly thinking that the physical body is the only reality. And even in meditation, we just imagine we are doing things and therefore the reality remains physical reality for us. But if we are able to pull our attention completely from the physical body, the so-called imaginative self becomes a greater reality than even the physical self and the physical experience. But both of them are merely a combination of sensory perceptions. They are all experiencing creation, destiny through the sensory system. The, we have outer eyes, we see with the eyes outside, and we have the ears, we have the nose to smell, we have the tongue to taste, we have the hand to touch. All these are in physical form, identically like that, they are also in the astral form. And we have the experiences of the astral world exactly like that. The only difference between the physical and the astral is in the astral we don't have any matter, no physical matter. That's the only difference. Everything else is the same. And when we don't have a physical matter, we become more lighter, we can fly, we can do many things which we cannot do with the weight of our bodies over here. That's a simple experience and the easiest way to find out. So many people have gone to the astral plane and discovered that the self is much lighter, self can do many things which the physical self cannot do, and they also see that what they were thinking of as the creator of the universe was merely the creator of the astral and the physical plane. When we talk of God, we say God is sitting in heaven. If God is sitting in heaven, we made him an indiv individual already. So individuation has occurred because we are talking of God sitting in heaven. We go and see God. Yes, we are able to see. The separation is still there. If one can go and see somebody, obviously you are not merged in that. You are not one with that. You are separate. That is why all religions, all religions without exception, have personified the creative power. And therefore they have individuated even the creative power. And therefore, we cannot go beyond our astral plane. All the gods we talk of, whether you call of Allah, Ishwar, Parameshwar, Zeus, or any other name you want to give, they are all being given to an individuated, personified god or creator at the astral plane. But beyond, beyond that, there would be no personification as we know it. Even the causal plane personification disappears when we discover that concepts can be personified. And that is why the truth lies way beyond. And it is only when we can go beyond the mind, which is not possible by meditation. I have often said that the limit of meditation is to take us to the causal plane. Even that is very rare. Most of the people who meditate and think they have gone to heaven, they go gone to the astral plane. All heavens described by religion are lying in the astral plane. All hells described by religion, are lying in the astral plane. This duality, that there has to be high and low, that there has to be good and bad, is all lying in the astral plane. And we go there and we discover a similar life like this. Truth, is, truth cannot be found just like that. The truth lies way beyond. The truth is, there is no duality at all. The truth is, there is only one. 
and the one contains everything, including what we are thinking, is separated. Sometimes we talk of our journey, that we are going to have a journey to Rajkhand, as if it's a travel, that we have to go somewhere, that we have left our home and come away, and now we have to go back. If that were so, there would be no totality as our home. Totality means everything is there, including ourselves. It's only when we reach totality of consciousness, what we call our true home, that we discover we never left it. We have never left our home. We only left the awareness of our home. We left the awareness of various experiences we had. And as we leave one and go into another awareness, we create a new level of consciousness, a new world in which we can live. So that is why all the descriptions we have of different levels are all within our true home, Satchkhand. Satchkhand does not mean that it is a distant destination we have to go to. Satchkhand means opening our eyes to the fact that we were sleeping and having dreams of various levels, and now we've woken up to discover there was only one totality. We are not individuated and separated. But because the birth of individuation took place, in our true home, by the use of consciousness in strange ways that we could use consciousness to expand awareness and to, and to contract awareness. That's a beautiful way that we can use awareness itself, that awareness can be expanded to totality and it can be contracted to individuation and a soul. That is why it's nothing more than the, than the expansion and contraction of awareness that's creating the whole universe. It's merely a game of awareness. Only when we reach the top do we discover the secret of the game. We cannot discover the secret of the game at any other level except at the top in our totality of consciousness, our true home. I often give you the example of this glass of water. Here is a glass of water. Tastes good. This glass of water has so many drops of water. This is one glass of water. What is making them drops of water when I look at this glass is my awareness. Nothing is happening to the glass. It's still total. My awareness can show small drops here. I am contracting my own awareness to make a little drops. But the glass never changes. If the water is still there. Totality of consciousness exactly like that. That we have everything there, total awareness, and we contract it to make us ourselves into drops, individuations, into souls. Soul is nothing more than a contraction of awareness in our true home and generating the feeling we are separated and we are one soul only. I'm in the, in the middle of millions and trillions of souls. But when we leave our true home, and come to a place where, they, where we cannot see totality at all, then it becomes like a separate stage of consciousness. So that is why when we start meditation in the physical life, from a physical body, it looks like we are traveling to some other place. But there is no journey actually. When we go to sleep and have a dream, in the dream we go far away from a body, but the physical body is lying in the bed in the same place. And we in the dream think we have gone far away. When we wake up, we had not gone far away, but we had an experience of going far away. The experience of going far away was real while we were dreaming. When we woke up, we discovered it was all happening in the same bed, in the same body where we were lying. If you take this example, you can understand each level of higher awareness is nothing more than awakening, awakening to a higher level. That's just one way of describing it. It's not exactly awakening from a dream, because in a dream we do not meditate to discover if we are awake or not. In the dream we just go through the dream, and when the dream ends we wake up. But here, in the physical form, we have a unique feature given to us only in the physical form, a unique feature 
which we call free will the great experience of making a decision that we decide to do something that does not occur in dreams we hardly ever decide things move so fast that before we can decide anything the next scene comes up dreams are very interesting we are studying our self in a little different form of consciousness different contraction of consciousness but in the physical world we have a feeling that we can do something of our own accord we have a free will that's a strange feature but very good feature and this feature is part of of our individuation part of our ego we are using our ego to make any decision out of free will the seeking of the truth within ourselves is also coming from the same ego but in a different direction the whole difference between a spiritual will and a, and a mental will is the direction in which you are using that will when you use it outside of yourself it becomes mental will use it within yourself it becomes spiritual will and that is why i understand now why we say hom mein dirag rog hai daru bhi is mahi that the ego is a very chronic disease but the treatment for that is also within it if we had no ego we would not be able to go anywhere so the ego is also a helper and is also a problem for us great master used to say that if we did not have any ego let us say we become so humble and say we have no ego we are never talking of i at all because ego is a problem therefore we are going to now give up all ego and become as humble as we can we say we are nobodies we are nothing if you start thinking like that you are nobodies and you are nothing where is the seeker gone where is the where is the soul trying to reach back home that disappeared also with your humility so humility can create a situation where you cannot even know what to do even on the spiritual path people who say we are very humble they try to break their ego and they can't even do any proper meditation then how do we use ego in a very positive way effective way and not try to make it small but make it large can we do that so that our ego which is a spiritual ego can we make it as big as we like while we are in the physical world yes great master explained that you can increase your ego to way beyond what you are using now the small ego the individual ego you are using to live in this world can be converted into a very large ego how is that done that is done by saying that you are not doing anything the master is doing everything when you enlarge your ego to the ego of your master and master is everything you are enlarging your ego in a spiritual way the ego that was bothering you was the one that you had created within yourself for yourself when you say the master is doing everything you are enlarging your ego because master ego is immense so instead of becoming weak by trying to be humble and small ego you take the big ego of your master and you live in his will when you live in the will of a master what do you experience the great power the great awareness of the master becomes your awareness you are leaving your life to be led by a much bigger ego of your master so that why great master explained that when we say that master doing everything we are really not breaking our ego into small bits but we are enlarging it into the ego of the master so the master does everything in your life you find that your iness has disappeared as a mental iness but the power of action power of living here power of experiences has increased to the level of your master and if you know that your master is totality of consciousness in a physical body imagine how far you can take your good ego and use it as a huge ego but it's not the same ego that's creating a problem for us so that is why the saints have recommended all the mystics have recommended that 
surrender to the master surrender is the is the way to enlarge your ego to the level of the one to whom you are surrendered it's a wonderful way we are now using the big ego of the master as our ego to do things the individual ego has disappeared and the big one has come and the big ego is definitely a very good cure for the disease we call ego or for the disease we call home is the answer to that question so that is why actually in meditation we get a chance to surrender to the master if we say the master is doing everything master is everything including ourselves and is operating from within ourselves the master ego huge ego becomes a great cure for the individuated ego that is creating problems for us so i am very happy to share these things with you but of course if you do meditation it is for meditation of these things that i talk to you i have mentioned to you several times the different stages that come when we go to uh, through meditation the first stage is easy to reach if we can become unaware of the body we have just to withdraw our attention and concentrate our attention behind the eyes at the third eye center if you close your eyes and feel where are you sitting if you are just sitting in the head automatically you know where you are just start acting with that inner self that inner body and gradually you will forget where the outer body is that's a simple trick simple method of discovering your inner self that is not difficult of course the next step is difficult because you have to meditate with the inner self and not with sitting in the body at all only when you have lost all awareness of the body and attained full awareness of your inner self with the same sense perceptions that you had on the body when that happens and then you meditate from there and withdraw attention from sense perceptions you come to discover the real secret from where all this creation has come which is our causal plane but even causal plane which we can attain through very deep meditation is not our true home it is just the basis of creation as we see it here to get our true home as i have often mentioned what is needed is love and devotion love comes from the soul not from the mind therefore if you want to be pulled by your own soul love and devotion is the best way love and devotion for who start with love and devotion for yourself and who is the self sitting inside the big ego your master therefore love and devotion for your master if you can't see him inside start from outside and you see him inside express your love and devotion inside love and devotion pulls you up to the causal plane we push ourselves beyond that we are pulled to a higher level and that is why when the time is right and we have to experience that the master appears inside and pulls us and we cannot see the master inside we can only see the master outside and therefore we feel that the master is not pulling us he is pulling outside which is not true when we start feeling a love and devotion for the master outside we are actually being pulled inside at the same time because the master outside that we see is merely a reflection of the master inside and that is why the love and devotion is the only way that takes us beyond the causal plane into a true home can we describe the true home in any terms not not really all descriptions that we have are based upon our knowledge of the physical world the physical world we see and we can describe things in certain language that we have associated with the objects and people that we see outside now there is no space and time therefore it is not possible to describe anything beyond the mind but we cannot say anything which is beyond so we make stories try to use the same analogy of what we see in the physical world we try to describe the higher world like that and our mind try to catch up there may be something very great very beautiful but like the physical world 
is just an amplification of physical experience. It's not like that at all. Since no description is available, that is why we just say a few things, masters have said a few things about what is there in our true home to describe our totality, which cannot be described when one goes to the highest level and becomes one with totality. What happens next? Well, there is no next because there is no time. There is no previous because there is no time. Then what is happening now? Is something happening in totality from where all this is being created? Well, descriptions have been given that there is something even happening beyond our true home, such kind. And people have mentioned to me that I should be able to tell them exactly what happens when a soul goes higher than such kind, beyond our true home, to places like which have been called Alak, Agam, Anami. What are these words? What do they mean? Alak means it cannot be lucky, it cannot be described. Well, nothing can be described in the true home also. It cannot be described what is above it. Then we say a gum cannot be known. An army cannot even be named. Why are we giving these different names to something that cannot be described, cannot be known, cannot be named even? What does it mean really? People don't understand that these are not stages where the soul has to go. This is a function that we are trying to describe as best as we can the function of totality of consciousness, where it can go into regions, go into awarenesses from which the whole world is created. These are awarenesses of Sat Purush, of totality. They are not awarenesses of a soul. A soul at the level of the totality merges into totality, becomes totality. A soul does not go anywhere after that. But totality has inner experiences by which the whole world is created below and those experiences have been described as the one that cannot be described, cannot be known, and cannot be, have a name even. So a luck, a gum, and an army are not three different stages, which people have started feeling. They may be the three more stages. No, there are no more stages. These are all experiences of Satpurush, of totality itself. And they are used so that the rest of the universe is created from there. The whole seed of creation that we know of is taking place right in our totality of consciousness, in such hand, our true home. What is happening there? When we go there, we find out what is happening there. It's a beautiful experience to know that totality has everything in it, higher and lower. Nothing is missing from totality. Everything, higher and lower. Allah, Kagam, Anami, and all the lower levels are all part of totality. They are nothing outside of totality. And that is why such cult is our true home. Short of that, we cannot have an understanding of totality. Even short of one place short, say Parbram. We go to Parbram, discover our soul. We still do not have any idea of totality. Not only that, in order to have the experience of our soul, we have to shut off the experience of the mind, the experience of the physical world. That is a very big handicap. We have a handicap in all the different stages of discovery of ourselves, and the handicap is that we have to turn off the other experience in order to have a higher experience. To have a dream experience, we shut off our wakeful experience. To have a wakeful experience, we shut off the dream experience, we shut off the astral experience, we shut off all experiences other than the physical experience. That is why the physical world looks so real to us, because we have shut off all other experiences. We go to astral plane, you cannot really experience the astral plane except by shutting off the physical plane and higher planes also. You cannot experience the causal plane, except by shutting off completely the awareness of the astral plane, physical plane, and all higher plane. These are individual experiences 
of a certain level at which the consciousness operates. We have to isolate ourselves into these different experiences to have that experience. That is why if there's a handicap, there's a disadvantage in going to these levels because we can only have experience of one level at one time. On the other hand, totality is all the levels together. And we cannot know that even in Par Brahm, there is only one level we will discover our soul. These experiences, physical, astral, causal, spiritual, are all individual levels of consciousness. Only we re realize that level of consciousness, we experience that, and we come back. Supposing we are experiencing these things while we are in a physical body, which is what we are intended to, intending to do in spiritual path, that we are trying to have experiences of higher levels of consciousness. When we do that, we can only experience one level at one time, other than shut off. That's a very big disadvantage. But we believe that the whole spiritual journey is like that. That is why we think that such khand or our true home or the totality of consciousness is also one step where we'll become part of that and become disassociated with all the other levels. But that's not, doesn't happen. It's a very different form of, of experience. Totality of consciousness, our Satchkhand, our true home, has all the levels together. Everything we're seeing here is also there. Everything in the astral plane is also there. Everything causal plane is also there. Everything spiritual is also there. Souls are also there. Bodies are also there. Mind is also there. Everything is all in totality. So it cannot be actually understood by the mind at all. How the whole totality is there, and we are calling it our destination, that we are performing a journey from one level to another, and we reach the highest level. It's not the highest level. It's total. It's complete. There's nothing more than that. That is why when we come across these people we call perfect living masters, what do they have which we don't have? They have the awareness of totality of consciousness, which means they are aware of what is happening in the physical world, they are aware of what is happening in the astral plane, they are aware of what is happening in the causal plane, they are aware of what is happening in the spiritual plane, they are aware of totality. They are aware of all these things at the same time. That is why when they come in a physical body, we have no idea what they know, what their awareness is. Their awareness is of all levels. And we cannot understand them. We cannot even appreciate them. Because when they have all levels, they live according to all levels. When a disciple meets a perfect living master in a physical body, he finds the perfect living master is just a physical being like himself or herself. No difference. We have a destiny to live through, a pralabd, our destiny karma, which we have come with. So has the master in his physical body, exactly like us. We go to work, he goes to work. We eat, drink, and we, we fall sick. So does he. He also eats, he does everything we do, and he also falls sick like we do. He goes to hospital like we do. He dies in the physical body like we die. Then what's the difference? The difference is not in the physical experience at all. He's leading exactly the same physical experience we are living. The difference is in the awareness. He is at that time living in Sajkarn, in Par Brahm, in causal plane in astral plane and physical plane at the same time. Not only that, he is working in these planes. Now supposing we are able to meditate enough to go to the astral plane inside, what will we find? Master will be exactly like ourselves in the astral plane. Just as we are, he will be like that. He will function like that. And we will see there is no difference between his astral form and our astral form. We go higher up the causal plane. The master is exactly like us in the causal plane. When we go to such Khan, he is totality, so are we. That's a beautiful game that is being played, that a perfect living master 
is aware of it all this while in the physical body in front of us. Yet he is he's operating at all levels simultaneously and we are not. We have confined ourselves to one level of awareness and he's total. He's not total higher up, he's total here. He is total even when we see the physical body of the person. His awareness is there, but he lives according to the level at which he is operating for us. It's a wonderful experience. Get to know your master. We think master is outside. We see him outside. Actually, he is inside. We see him outside because he is inside. If he was not inside, you would not see him outside. And that is why go inside and check out is the master that you saw outside is also inside. When you will spend time with the master inside, you will find he was always inside. That is why you could see him outside. He appeared outside in your life because he was inside. And very often you will find he was inside for a much longer period than the time you spent outside. Some people say, oh, it took me 60 years before I met the master. Julian Johnson, I remember, the American disciple, he said that to me once. Oh, I came so late to see the master. I lived half, more than two-thirds of my life without the master. I have come at an old age to see the master. And the master later showed him he was with him all the time, not in 60 years later. The master is there with us from the time of our birth, not when we find him outside. Finding him outside is just a program made so that we can see the master outside. When the time is right, we go in and we discover that our association with the master was a much older one. Sometimes we can even feel outside. Many people would come to great master, say, Master, I feel I've known you for a long time. And the master would say, yes, we have known each other for a long time. And meeting for the first time physically, but known for a long time. This is a very beautiful game. Go inside and find out. Do meditation to the extent that you can find out that your relationship with the master is a permanent relationship from the beginning of time. It's not now. Only the time at which you will meet the master had been fixed. And you meet him outside in the physical world at that time. But he is your master from the beginning. That's a very big thing you discover. I am once again very happy that I could talk to you and share these things with you. And I am glad that you are all taking great precautions. Please follow the guidelines that your governments and health agencies are telling you. Follow them, take care of yourself. And I am praying to Great Master to help all of us remain safe and healthy. Thank you very much. I take leave now. I'll see you again next month.